Well, I want to start out with Ephesians 4. Uh, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, verse 1, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. <clears throat> one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. So as we begin our study on theological triage, it becomes clear that there's really always been a pressing need in the Christian church to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The need is particularly urgent in our day, I believe, because our culture is increasingly polarized. It's increasingly impatient with one another, and it's dis, uh, distorted and disoriented in its definition of love. We teeter really on the edge of cultural collapse. I don't know if any of us in this room have felt that pressure before in America, but our culture is certainly there. How easily do we dismiss one another in our current culture? How easily do we just uh, cancel or slough one another off? How easily do we become impatient with one another? How distorted is our understanding of love? Uh, how often does our culture opt for the thoughtless tool of tribalism? Well, if we just get together enough voices and shout loud enough, that has to be truth. Might makes right in our culture, and that's just not right. So we're very weak in our culture at setting forth arguments. We, we try to solve our problems on a platform that allows us 280 characters at a time to solve the most deep and profound cultural issues of our day. And it just goes, goes to show a lot of things about what's wrong with our culture. Elon Musk may be the bastion of free speech for us on that platform, but 280 characters to solve some deep uh, cultural issues, I don't know. Um, he needs to do some triage. So we as Christians, we can't uh, say we're unaffected in the church. We're affected by how our culture uh, presses in on us. We think we're immune from this sickness, but we're not. There's a great danger, and uh, our mindset can be uh, crafted by these things, can be changed uh, by these things, and especially on theological matters. There's as much vitriol and imbalance in theological tweets as there are in the culture. There's virtually no difference. We've, we've uh, many have mentioned before that the divorce rate in the culture is exactly the same as in the church. Well, there's not a lot of difference in the way we debate either. We just get nasty real quick. Um, eagerness, Paul says, to maintain the unity of the faith is one of the central things we ought to be focused on as a church. In fact, it's a command in Ephesians 4. He commands it because the fact is we have to work at unity. We naturally divide. That's the flesh. That's the fallen part of us. We naturally just want to carve one another off. We want to cause little uh, cliques and groups. We have to fight for unity. And that unity has to be deeply maintained and so he says for us to be eager in maintaining the unity of the church. It's a word that kind of brings to mind um, abiding and fervent warmth among us as Christians. Um, it, it, make, it, it, it hints at making every effort to do so. Uh, it kind of made me think of the song, ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley wide enough or low enough, ain't no river wide enough. We have to hurry, hurry to be conscientious about doing so. We have to make unity a constant consideration in our lives as Christians. And so eager unity is the glue that binds us together. And so we can't be uh, unified without doing a proper triage of doctrine. We just can't. It's something we can't avoid. 
And so this term theological triage really came from Al Mohler back in, I think, 2004. He coined it in a blog. Uh, and it's a good term. Um, I think it's a, it's a good term because it gives our minds a concept to work with when we're trying to balance out doctrine. And so um, though Moeller coined the term, the concept of theological ranking is kind of very old. Um, for you super nerds out there, if you want to pick up Turretin's uh, volume one, question 14, he goes into some massive detail about this. We won't go into that here. But maybe our antennas went up when I said doctrinal ranking. Uh, maybe you said something like this, all truth is equally important. How can you say one is greater than the other? It always the same, just like all sin is the same. Really? God hates all sin, so all sin is the same, right? Well, I'd humbly beg you to reconsider that proposition. We have to realize, and what I hope to show in the next two Sundays, that the Bible has indeed a doctrinal ranking system, and a healthy one. It has a very healthy one. Just as it weighs sin, okay, it weighs and ranks doctrine as well. Every truth is important. Don't, don't hear what I'm not saying, okay? Every truth is important, but not every truth is of first importance, okay? So with those kind of introductory thoughts, let's talk about the agenda, the what, the why, the Bible system of triage and some pitfalls to avoid. Uh, I'm hoping, Lord willing, to get through the first two this morning. So the what of uh, triage, the why, then uh, we'll look at the Bible's own system of triage. We're going to be looking at a handful of texts together that help you see uh, what God wants you to see. So the what. Um, what is triage? Well, it has a, a medical reference, uh, obviously, and most people are familiar with the word triage. Uh, if you're not, it's simply a word that's used typically in the medical field that means sorting or prioritizing patients and their needs according to their urgency. This method was really born out of a deep understanding by medical professionals and, and their, their knowledge of the body and its systems, how it works. And it's crucial for saving lives. Uh, it assesses the body's needs. And uh, if you ever go to the hospital, you want a doctor who does proper theological triage. Um, tons of examples could be brought up here. But triage, medical triage at least, has several goals. Uh, it seeks to gather vital signs, medications, past medical history. Uh, it seeks to maximize the number of survivors and minimize the number of casualties. It seeks to allocate resources to those who can most benefit from them. It seeks efficiency of evaluation. It seeks to avoid two extremes, overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. And it also seeks the sustained life and maximal health of the patient. Again, much more could be said. I was trying to boil down all that I'd read on triage. I know there's men in this room who have degrees in this, so forgive me for any oversimplifications. Uh, the Emergency uh, Severity Index was standardized in 1999. That gives me the heebie-jeebies. That means for a ton of time in our medical history, we had no standardized severity index. You could walk in and it may be all over the place how you get treated. Uh, so uh, most emergency rooms operate on an emergency severity index. And you can see these five levels of severity. So you can see, you know, level one, immediate. You're in cardiac arrest, you have massive bleeding. Level two, high risk, cardiac related chest pain, asthma. You know, scroll down the list, you get down to the bottom, you're coming in with a rash or something like that. You're stable, you don't need that high level of triage. Now what's interesting about this chart is from levels three to five, ones that are not categorized as life-threatening, uh, they're no longer determined by urgency, but by resources needed and the experience of the nurse. And so once it gets to the non-life-threatening um, uh, category, it's no longer determined by urgency, 
but by resources needed. So if we're out of Tylenol and this guy's hurting worse than this guy, well, we may give it to this guy versus this guy. He's not going to die, neither they're going to die. So we triage, uh, medical professionals triage. So I hope that gives you a little bit of a picture of where we're going. As with medical triage, we have a theological triage. So what does it do? It seeks to sort uh, and prioritize doctrines and their needs according to their urgency. Uh, Moeller states this, it's a discipline, a, a discipline of theological triage would require Christians to determine a scale of theological urgency that would correspond to the medical world's framework for medical priority. And so I think we can say several things about theological triage. First, a theological triage seeks to sort and prioritize doctrines according to their urgency. Can y'all see that very well? Okay. Hopefully it's not hard on your eyes. <clears throat> so as we'll see, some doctrines are more important than others and at times need to be emphasized more than others. If you've read church history, you know that there were certain times where the guns were aimed at certain things that we were fighting through as Christians together. Uh, other things were secure and safe and didn't need to be emphasized as much. Um, down through the ages, a ranking or prioritizing of doctrine has been part and parcel of how we've survived as a church and live in faithfulness to God. And kind of the tone of these, uh, these two talks is uh, at peace with one another, at peace with one another. Again, all doctrines are equally true, but not, are, uh, not all are equally important all the time. Okay, so first theological triage seeks to prioritize doctrines. Secondly, uh, theological triage seeks to minimize the number of, uh, maximize the number of survivors and minimize the number of casualties. Don't get that backwards. Um, certain vital doctrines, that was not a Freudian slip. Uh, just kidding. Uh, certain vital doctrines, if denied, if denied, certain vital doctrines, if denied and opposed willfully, will result in eternal casualties. It will, okay? Heresy kills. Uh, other doctrines that do not threaten life, but if they're held in the wrong way, can cause wounds that, if left unchecked, can infect the whole body and could potentially lead to death. Sometimes doctrines, when, uh, when they're not informed by the vital doctrines, they can move slowly and almost imperceptibly through uh, the body. They can creep and ultimately, they can begin to affect the vital organs. So triage seeks to maximize survivors and minimize casualties. Now, who does not want to do that? Um, we want to see the church healthy and strong, and even our own Christian lives as we talk with one another. Uh, third, theological triage seeks to allocate resources to those who most benefit from them. So when triage is done appropriately, it helps properly allocate time and energy toward those doctrines that strengthen the church at various moments in time. So um, I was reading on the National Institute of Health. They published an article uh, titled Triage Protocol for Allocation of Critical Health Resources During the COVID-19 Health Emergency. And basically the brass tacks of the several articles that I read was COVID-19 broke the triage um, scale, we could say. They were panicking on how to allocate resources, okay? The pandemic stressed one facet of the triage process. There was no metric for the allocation of resources in a pandemic, and so all these, all these big heads got together and tried to create a triage scale for a pandemic. Well, thankfully... Scripture is complete and a sufficient repository of doctrine that can triage any doctrinal situation. We don't have pandemics that hit the church that we're unprepared for. Scripture has all that we need. It's sufficient in all ways. So there's no theological pandemics unknown to man. And there's nothing theologically new under the sun. 
And so this should give us comfort as we triage. We're not going to uh, fundamentally or categorically run into things that the church hasn't faced before and that the word of God is not sufficient to answer, okay? We have an endless fountain of resources. So something like this. Uh, if a brother or sister is fretting about head coverings, okay, that's something in uh, many people's thinking. They're fretting about head coverings and another brother or sister's wavering concerning the Lord's Supper. How do I, how do I view that properly? Triage helps the Christian adequately allocate time and resources to the latter, the issue over the Lord's Supper, um, because it recognizes that the Lord's Supper can affect how we live a lot quicker than the issue of head coverings, okay? Um, it carries more theological weight and influence. So, unfortunately, the former ends up creeping into the church a lot quicker, we, we major on the minors, and we minor on the majors. And that's just the nature of who we are. We want to, you know, well, didn't you see this text, brother? And you should be doing this. Uh, I like what Alistair Begg says. He says, we have to keep the plain things the main things, and the main things the plain things. Fair enough. I think that's a very good way to look at it. So triage helps us allocate time. You can't ever answer every phone call and email with equal urgency. I'm sorry, not everything's on fire in the same way. It's just not. And we do that in our lives personally as well. So I'm begging for this in our theological lives as well. Theological triage seeks uh, efficiency of evaluation. So when we triage correctly, we reduce the associated risks caused by stressful conversations over doctrinal matters. What do I mean? I'm going to put it in street terms for you. It helps you keep your mouth shut and your heart calm and at peace when you're sitting at the Thanksgiving dinner table and that certain relative keeps bringing up that theological issue and you just feel your teeth clench and your gut gets tight and you're like, what do I do? Is this even worth fighting for? Well, when we triage correctly, we can have a calm heart because we can know where we're at in that conversation and go, okay. This is not a life or death thing. This is a matter of secondary or tertiary importance, okay? So we don't have to be uh, busy-minded or worried if we triage correctly. Um, the more efficient you can be in triage, the more helpful and Christ-like you are to others. Now, I can't speak to the personality of your relative. That's not what this Bible study is about. That's a topic for another time. But... This will at least help you think about if we triage correctly, I don't have to be so uptight about those Thanksgiving conversations if I know where they fall in the scale of things, okay? I can think rightly about these things. Theological triage seeks to avoid two immature and major faults in our thinking, fundamentalism and liberalism. Both are equally immature. Fundamentalism is immature in one way, Liberalism is very immature in another way. Fundamentalism uh, tends to see every doctrine as equally essential, and it elevates what we would discover as secondary and even tertiary to a fundamental level. Everything's just on fire, okay? Uh, Turretin notes this attitude, and he says, it turns every error into heresy and makes necessary those things which are indifferent among us so as more easily to prove that we differ on fundamentals. So fundamentalists make everything a fundamental, a, a core uh, uh, root doctrine, everything. doesn't matter what it is. Calvin makes this point that churches will not survive apart from a willingness to tolerate error on lesser matters. Churches won't survive. They won't thrive. They won't grow in love and unity if we're not willing to tolerate errors on lesser matters. In his Institutes, he says, a difference in opinion over these non-essential matters should in no wise be the basis of schism among Christians. Either we must leave no church remaining, okay, we can't agree on anything, and I'm the arbiter of truth, and so you don't agree with me, and we just split up. 
Or we must condone delusion in those matters which can go unknown without harm to the sum of religion and without loss of salvation. Fundamentalism has been very poor at this, despite their, quote, strict, literal interpretation of Scripture. It just makes everything a primary doctrine, just elevates everything. Liberalism, on the other hand, on the other end of the spectrum, tends to minimize doctrinal standards in reaction to fundamentalists and other, others who would take seriously doctrinal matters. Richard Baxter once said, many an error is taken up by going too far from another man's faults. So you examine a guy's faults and you totally pendulum swing to the opposite side. You've overcorrected. You've not rightly corrected. So many an error is taken up by going too far from another man's faults. In other words, overreactions and this total pendulum swing at error are themselves errors. This is a tendency of our current Christian culture. What do they say? No creed but the Bible. Well, that's a creed. <laughs> you get that. No creed but the Bible is a creedal statement, and we don't live like that as Christians. It's a total swing in the opposite direction. So both fundamentalism and doctrinal minimalism are immature. They don't triage correctly. One treats a theological splinter like a gunshot wound. And the other treats a theological gunshot wound like a splinter. That's imbalanced. That's not a proper triage. So if we do triage correctly, if we don't do triage correctly, we're going to fall into one of those two ditches. That's just what we're going to do. Theological triage seeks the sustained life and maximal health of the Christian, the Christian church. So when done correctly, the Christian creates a context for sustained health and maximal life for not only himself but his fellow Christians, his or her own local church and the wider universal church. And so who, who doesn't want that as a, as a goal of their life as a Christian to see not only themselves but their brothers and sisters healthy in the Lord, walking strong in the Lord? But let me say this. Everyone does theological triage. You cannot escape it. Um, if you're uncomfortable with what I'm saying, guess what you've just done? Theological triage. You've ranked and weighed what I've said as, is that biblical or not? Okay? You're doing it right now. So how well we do it is my concern. You're doing it. But how well we do it is my concern. It's, as Moeller states, a question of Christian maturity and wisdom. And so this is a little bit of the what of theological triage. Let's talk about, in our remaining time, the why, the why. So why should we do theological triage? Look at those two handsome guys. Whew, they need a haircut. So um, why should we do uh, theological triage? Because we want balance in our life as Christians. Who are these two guys? Does anybody know who this is? Maybe the top one, but not the bottom one. Brandon knows. <laughs> Somebody besides the egghead in the room. Ulrich Zwingli, right, okay. So, strangely at this point, when I'm talking about right theological triage, I'm quoting from a man who torched his fellow Christian, and I mean torched him. Um, Luther torched Zwingli over an issue of the Lord's Supper, and he was an infamously <clears throat> bad example of triage during the Reformation. In, in Christian history, these men met over what's called the Marburg Colloquy. They met together to hash it out. What's the Lord's Supper? What's the nature of the Lord's Supper? And it was really akin in the reform world to our own civil war. Two men who were so closely linked together ended up with, at war with one another over the issue of the Lord's Supper. Luther being the strict one and uh, extending the fundamentals more widely than he ought, which he was apt to do in other things, 
when he, when he was approached by Zwingli with the right hand of fellowship, Zwingli's like, we're still brothers, right? You know what Luther responded? You're of a different spirit. You're of a different spirit. Luther, in effect, was questioning Zwingli's authenticity as a Christian over the Lord's Supper. Luther wasn't known for his patience and cool spirit. I mean, look at that just German scowl right there. He just looks like he's suspicious of others. But he said this, and he said something very helpful. He said, human nature is like a drunk peasant. Lift him up on the saddle on one side, and he topples over to the other. Luther was recognizing something about us as humans and even Christians post-rebirth. We are imbalanced, and it takes a lot of work and thought to be balanced Christians. We're not immune from being imbalanced. <clears throat> and so a proper triage helps us walk with balance in the Christian life. And there's plenty of examples throughout church history of really bad triage, okay? Um, Gavin Ortland, I recommended this book from the pulpit uh, last Sunday, he said this, in his book, Finding the Right Hills to Die On. It's easy to lose your balance when you're standing on one foot. Flamingos do it well, but we're not flamingos. Uh, the strongest posture is one, is one of balance between both feet, one of poise. And he talks about that's why a boxer puts so much care into his footwork. In our theological life as well, we need poise. The character of the gospel is complex. It contains both truth and grace, both conviction and comfort, both hard edges and logic and deep caverns of mystery. It's at one, in, it's at one moment as bracing as a cool breeze and the, and the next as nourishing as a warm meal. Faithfulness to the gospel, therefore, requires more than one virtue. We must at times boldly contend and at other times gently probe. In one situation, we must emphasize what is obvious, and in another, we must explore what is nuanced. Well, we've seen we want balance, but I want to make another point. If we don't triage in the right way, if we do this wrongly, we cripple ourselves in the fight. When we're defending the faith, when we're walking together shoulder to shoulder for the faith of the gospel, if we don't get this right, we cripple ourselves, we risk wounding or even killing our own at worst, and discouraging and dissuading others at best. Uh, a call to defend the faith is a call to theological triage. We've seen that in Jude, I think, over and over, and we're going to see that more particularly as we move down through the, uh, through the passage. Uh, we've seen in Jude that it's all hands on deck. Uh, no one who names the name of Christ is exempt from this labor in contending for the faith. Um, we run a risk, however, of crippling ourselves and wounding those we love if we're not efficient in theological triage. We'll spend resources on things that don't matter. We'll paralyze ourselves and not spend at all time, energy, money, whatever it may be. We discourage and dissuade growth very quickly by majoring on minors and minoring on majors. Christians have died many times from friendly fire, literally and figuratively. Uh, some pastors have become so discouraged by the crossfire, they've left the ministry because their congregants major on the minors, and they just burn them out. Pastors are men too, and they can get burnt out. Okay? Okay. Um, there goes one more soldier of the cross off the battlefield. Do we really want to do that? Many Christians shrink back from working through theological issues verbally as they seek to grow in a community of faith for fear of saying, saying something wrong. And they may be ostracized. I don't want anybody to think I'm stupid by asking this question. I've heard that from younger disciples, and I'm like, please stop saying that. Stop hedging yourself with, I don't want to sound stupid. Please don't judge me. Just ask the question. Are we communicating a, a, a community of love in which those things can be asked and grown uh, through? We can work through those issues. We can wound young Christians by not doing proper theological triage. 
Um, improper theological triage is full of snap judgments, impatience, improper analysis, unrealistic expectations of newborn Christians. The scripture says milk is for the babe. A steak is for the man, okay? Uh, newborn babes in Christ, you can't feed them the same way you can feed a 20-year-old Christian. We have to know that as we're working with others. Some of the, the richest soil in which we grow is where mature triage can receive any question, any question, and know how to handle it in its proper context. But don't think we can't go beyond actually killing one another. This is a picture of one of the first people who uh, was martyred as a quote-unquote Protestant at the hand of other Protestants. Uh, orders given by none other than Ulrich Zwingli. This man was drowned because he refused to be baptized again. He was, uh, this, uh, Zwingli was affected by Luther's stance on uh, the Lord's Supper, but he goes on to do this. He goes on to kill other people who differ from him on the mode of baptism. He drowned them. Um, this is a caveat, dirt road, sidetrack. Once again, why we don't want a church-state union. It gets bloody real fast. And if we forget this in our history, we're being knuckleheads, okay? He killed people over the issue of baptism. He triaged completely wrong, completely wrong. There were church-state things going on at the time that, that affected his theology. Another reason we should be concerned about theological triage is wise men in the past have been concerned about it, and we've got to hustle. The church is a terrific example historically of theological triage. We don't have, to, we don't have time to examine all these things, but the various creeds of Christendom, the Nicene Creed was triage. The Apostles' Creed was triage. The Athanasian Creed was triage, and on and on and on. These men who carved out as they saw in Scripture, the main doctrinal tenets that linked us together and set the boundaries of orthodoxy, okay? And they've proven over time to be extremely important in guiding the church through the centuries. In fact, I think they set the historical tone and boundaries in many ways for how we triage. Did anybody grow up in the church uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed every Lord's Day? Okay, all right. There's a reason why. Most churches did that. I'm not saying it's wrong or right, but they were trying to keep something in, in front of everybody as they joined together. Here's the boundaries. Here's the boundaries. So our own confession is a proof of theological triage. Uh, listen to how these men talked. They used the same terminology as their brothers. Different persuasions. They were talking to Presbyterians and Congregationalists. They used the exact words of the other side. Why did they do this? He sa they say, this we did, the more abundantly to manifest our consent in all the fundamental articles of the Christian religion, and as with many others whose orthodox confessions have been published in the world on the behalf of Protestants in diverse nations and cities. These men were not doing narrow theology. They were doing broad, hearty highlight marker theology. Here's where we agree with 99.9% .9 of known Christendom at the time. They were showing they were in agreement with these men on the fundamental articles of the Christian religion. They sought to show forth their agreement in the widest possible sense and on a global scale. They had in their own words, I like this phrase, no itch to clog religion with new words. That's just such a 16th century English phrase. Who says itch to clog religion? No one. But do readily acquiesce in that form of sound words which has been in consent with the Holy Scriptures used by others before. So what were they saying? They were like Jude. They... Um, they were deeply driven and more inclined to highlight the things in common. They didn't want to clog religion with new words. They didn't want to be novel. They wanted to repeat what they had received from the past. And in the things which they differed, they confessed to being openly plain, with modesty, with humility, and with desire to be 
inoffensive. And as to their precision, so you think, wow, we're doctrinally precise at this church. Does that make us uh, curmudgeons? No, these men weren't. They show themselves to be abundantly loving. Here's what they say in the preface to the reader uh, in our confession. I would encourage you to go read that, please. Um, It sets a, a tone for what you see in their theology. We can kind of pick up in those chapters in our confession and go, well, here's what they believe, and they were just bulldozing everybody with that. Go, go, go read the tone in which they use those doctrines in their life. It, it's, it's heartwarming. It's heartwarming. They say, we've also taken care to affix texts of Scripture at the bottom of these paragraphs for the confirmation of each article in our confession, in which work we have studiously endeavored to select such as are most clear and pertinent for the proof of what is asserted. What a rarity to have utter doctrinal precision and warmth. A backbone of steel and a heart of, and a tongue of velvet. That's just, you know, when we did our study on Newton, that's what encouraged me so much about Newton. He was a man who was resolute theologically, and he was so tenderhearted. We have to be the same in theological triage. And they were mature men. They were mature men. They were hardy men, big-chested men, particular men for the truth. And they said, uh, contention is most remote from our design. As they penned this, they weren't thinking of contention. They were thinking of unity. They were thinking of doing right triage to unify the church. And they triaged well. And I think the proof of that is the fruit that they've born in that document, and we're proof of that 400 some odd years later. We may believe their doctrine, beloved, but the question in our theological triage is, do we have their balance? Do we have their balance? Are we of the same spirit? And so these men confessed Uh, something that was exemplified by... Now, I don't know if this quote is actually his. I've done some study on this, and I don't think Augustine actually said this, but it's attributed to him because Augustine's like Babe Ruth of Christianity. So give Augustine anything, and it's it's gold, right? Uh, So Augustine is attributed as saying, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. Uh, church historian Philip Schaff said, this is the watchword for Christian peacemakers. And this is a, a little phrase that I think we should lock in our hearts. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in all things, charity. Charity is just an older way of saying love. Love. We can do this in love. And so next time, we will examine the biblical data for theological triage. So we're going to get down in the scripture And hopefully we're going to look at some pitfalls to avoid. So uh, come prepared next time to dig into the Scripture. So I hope the Lord gives us wisdom in this. We need it. We need it. So any questions really quickly before we close in prayer? That was it. Yeah. Yeah. They knew what they were doing. They knew the risk they were taking as well. Uh, probably one of the disadvantages we have to Twitter is if I think it, I can say it immediately. When I write a letter, I have to think what I'm saying, and it takes two and a half weeks on a donkey to get there. Yeah, but that, was, that, was worked that was worked on. I think it was what, 100 churches worked on that. 100 churches, 100 men at least, representative of those churches. So, yeah. Um, I'm anti uh, social media. I just never had it because it's just too nasty. There's just too much. But anyways, that's a, that's a diatribe I don't need to go into. Any other questions or thoughts? I hope this was helpful. Okay, good. Well, let me pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for the mercy you've given us in studying these things together as a, as a church body. Help us to love one another. Help us to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Help us to do proper triage. Give us a, um, 
a readiness to come back next time to see what the Bible says and to uh, lock those things down in the core of who we are, that we can be stronger Christians and that we can contend for the faith rightly. May you receive all glory today in our worship. In Christ's name, amen.